Good morning. We are going to go ahead and get started. I'm Lisa Blanco, and I'm the chair of the Terry College Alumni Board. I'm here on behalf of Dean Ayers, who unfortunately could not be here with us this morning, but fortunately for our dear Run Fellows, he is participating in a retreat with them. I want to welcome those of you who have not been to Terry Third Thursday before to the TEEK, our Terry Executive Education Center. This is our base operation in Atlanta where we bring professionals together to discuss industry matters and for networking. I want to thank all of those on the alumni board who have participated in securing such great speakers on a monthly basis. I particularly want to recognize John O'Neill, our current chair, and Nancy Watley, our past chair. I also want to recognize our sponsors. As you know, it takes a lot to put this on, and I'd like to recognize Bank of North Georgia, who has been with us really since the beginning of time, and we appreciate their continued corporate sponsorship. We have two media sponsors, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and Public Broadcasting Atlanta, WABE. Please give a warm and grateful round of applause for our sponsors. I also want to highlight some upcoming events. Next month, on November 16th, we have Frank Blake, the former chairman and CEO of the Home Depot, who will be joining us. We will not have Terry Third Thursday, as is our custom in December, and we will resume in January. A few other upcoming Terry College events. November 15th, we have our Professional Women's Conference. This is a fabulous event. The Home Depot is hosting us this year. So if you have um, talented young women in your organization that you would like to send to that event, please check out the Terry website for more information. Also, we have our annual um, economic outlook forecast, which will take place at the Marriott Marquis again this year on December 14th. Dennis Lockhart will deliver the national forecast for 2018 alongside Dean Ayers, who will focus more on the state's economic performance. Registration for that is also open on the Terry College website. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Egbert Perry. Egbert is the co-founder, chairman, and CEO of Integral, a provider of sustainable real estate and community solutions in mature and emerging markets across the world. A community development, commercial real estate, and construction professional since 1979, Egbert has developed and or built most project types, including residential, office, retail, institutional, and mixed-use projects. He's an active member of charitable organizations, serving on many boards, including the Centennial Academy, Atlanta Business League, Central Atlanta Progress, the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, and the Carter Center. Egbert is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, where he earned both a bachelor and master's degree in civil engineering, as well as an MBA. He was honored in 1990 as the 11th graduate in the University of Pennsylvania's history to be named to the Gallery of Distinguished Engineering Alumni. His topic today is navigating the spectrum from community development to commercial real estate. Please join me in welcoming Egbert Perry. Thank you. Good morning. Um, hmm, I forgot that that was the topic. <laughs> so I'm going to do a little bit of recalibration. Um, and the people at this table, four of them, so Lisa, you don't fall in this category, they said, please say something we haven't heard before because <laughs> they're with integral. Um, so John, John on another occasion said, Egbert, when you get up there, I'd like you to sort of tell your story and then maybe talk about a couple of projects that are the things you like best about what you've done over your career. And I always hate those kind of uh, positionings because it sounds as if people think my career is over. Um, 
and I hope I have a few more years left to go because I have a lot of things that I haven't done. Um, so let me just do a couple of things to paint a picture of who is up here. Everybody that comes up here to speak to you has some story. Everybody has a story. And they are who they are based on something. And so in my case, I am a transplanted immigrant from Antigua, Eastern Caribbean. Most of you didn't hear about Antigua until Irma made her famous. Um, so it's actually Antigua and Barbuda, and Irma sort of changed her mind at the last minute, and instead of wiping out Antigua, it wiped out our sister island of, Anti of Barbuda. So that's where I'm from, and I always say you can take everybody from Antigua, put them on a plane, on planes, get them into the Georgia Dome, and you'd still have 10,000 empty seats. So that's where I grew up. Very fortunate. My life is based so far largely on a lot of good luck, good fortune, and grace that I probably don't deserve. Um, I'm number nine of 11 kids, and my uh, parents were con artists because I grew up thinking we were well off. <laughs> um, I was in heaven on earth. You know, the Antigua I grew up in was uh, sort of that proverbial African village. So it takes a village to raise a child well. Um, full support and everybody looked out for everyone and it was, I have probably 250 first cousins so it's a very incestuous, not, lit, <laughs> not literally, but um, incestuous environment. So everybody knew everyone and so um, it, I wasn't a TV baby so I didn't grow up with a view that I never was anything, am nothing, never will be anything and so everybody I saw from here to here look like me and so I didn't come into the world or emerge on the stage with the baggage that is probably more typical if you're born in this country because I always say if you're black and poor or let's say poor and black or brown you're probably pre-sentenced before you leave the womb you are sentenced to worse educational opportunities and the worst living environments. And if you make it out, you're overcoming a trajectory that was set before you left the womb. So poverty is a crime here. It wasn't a crime where I grew up, at the time I grew up. Probably more of a crime now back home. So I consider myself fortunate in that regard. And to put everything in perspective, because when I look back, this is hard to even fathom, but when I got to my last two years of high school, somebody, this is where luck comes in, had the best parents a person could have. They sent me off. I won a scholarship to a boarding school in New York, finished my last two years there. And when I got to the boarding school, I actually came to, it's in New York, so I landed in New York City. I had a sister who was living in New York, so I stayed with her for a couple of weeks before going to the school, and by the time I got to the school, there was an envelope waiting for me with my name on it and my father's return address written up in the left corner. And when I opened the envelope, there was a $20 bill in there, which is $20 US, that's about $54 back home. It's a Eastern Caribbean currency. And I wrote, I got it, I cried a little bit and wrote a note back and said, Daddy, I know $54 is a lot of money. Um, take it back, I'll, I'll be fine. I cried the next day when I realized how much stuff really costs. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the day I realized that I grew up poor and just didn't know it. I'm talking $20. So, you know, be along the way I used to skip classes and so on and paint and cut grass and do everything to save money. But when I went, th I went through my, after I finished high school, I went to, I applied to Penn, went to Penn, I was there for seven years, went to work in DC. And the good news is, because I didn't grow up with high expectations as with respect to material things, uh, I went to work for a company in DC and I saw the glass ceiling very quickly, within a year, and I said, I don't need this. So I, responded to 
some inquiries that I had been getting while I was at Penn from a guy down here who I had no interest in coming to the South, always thought they were still lynching black people in the South. That's the view I had, so I'd never been to this part of the country. But I said, okay, I'm, I'll move. So I moved to Atlanta to work for H.J. Russell and Company. <coughs> Excuse me. And another one of those lucky things was I was at Russell for four months, um, and Herman called me, and I was hired as assistant to the president. So it was Russell at the time was about a $10 or $12 million a year company. And he said, Herman said, Egbert, I need you to do a business plan for the company, which I did. And it took me about five or six months. Actually, very much like if I was in business school doing a plan, so it had it's probably as useless a document looking back as, as it could have been, but it felt like I was doing a great um, case study and so on and so forth, and I made my recommendations. And about three, three weeks later, this was, I gave it to him in an October, because I remember November he calls me in and he says, okay, um, I went through the document. I have a lot of questions for you and so on. So we chatted for about an hour. And then he said, okay, um, next month I'm making you president of the company. Now, I was 24 when I joined the firm in January. My birthday is in July. So this is now November. So I'm 25. And he said, so I'm putting you to run the company. I see Parker Hudson here, and Parker and I go back many years, and we did some work together while I was at Russell. But, so at 25, I got a blank sheet of paper for this company to do whatever I wanted to. You don't get that often. I wouldn't have gotten that opportunity anywhere else in life. And I was there for about 12 more years. So I was there a total of 13 years. And when I left, we were about a $200 million a year company, and we were the third largest black-owned business in the United States. That's an indictment on the state of black business, not a commendation for the achievement at Russell, but it said that um, I got a chance to be in the midst of doing something that I would never have had and didn't even realize or appreciate where I was and the opportunity I had been given until many years later. So that's, that's another luck. And to leave Russell, I had to leave for something important. And along the way, I saw that there were a lot of people who, if you paint the picture back to the story about poor black and brown, I did a lot of development and construction and so on in urban centers and saw a lot of people that looked like me that but for economic circumstances uh, or because of economic circumstances were living a life that was already set to be something not quite where it needed to be. So I was going to transform urban America. Sounded like a good idea. Didn't know what the hell that meant. Um, so when I left Russell, it was to start this company called Integral. And Integral was going to do that, revitalize the country, the urban, underserved neighborhoods. And that's the purpose of Integral. So the point at which I would say a project defined who I was was a project called Centennial Place. Uh, we responded in 94 to an RFP to tackle the site of the very first public housing project in the country. Um, it was 1,100 public housing units right next to Georgia Tech and Coca-Cola, and it was hell on earth. Atlanta was the most violent city in the United States in that year. And Techwood Homes was the most violent address in the city, notwithstanding that the next door neighbors were Coca-Cola and Georgia Tech. Average household income was $4,300 a year, and all of that wasn't earned income. And it was just hell on earth. And if you think about it, 50% of the people living in that community were kids, children. So that's what they were growing up in. 25% were seniors, and the other 25% were regular adults, not quite as old as all of you in the room and me. But no, a lot of young people, but they were, you know, from 20s and 30s. Um, so these were conditions that were stifling. No way anything coming out of there was going to be 
a good outcome. And so we responded, my buddy and I, who I met at that boarding school, and we went to Penn together and ended up being closest friends. And his father was from Anguilla, so in the summers I would go back home to work. We had a little store in Antigua. And then we'll go to Anguilla and then fly back up to college. So um, he and I, it was a two-person firm, and there's one other person, Valerie here, that was sort of a consultant. She wasn't getting paid, so I don't know what you call it. But <laughs> we said, oh, we're going to respond to this. Oh, Eric, I forgot. Eric was there, too. He was with another firm. So we're going to respond to this, um, and we did. And we came up with this grand vision, and all of it was born out of simple questions. What would that community need to be if you were going to live there? And we came up with something we call the Integral Quality of Life Circle, and it had early childhood development, great school, something for recreation and wellness and health, and that's a why, and mixed income housing, because we're going to have to create housing that isn't stigmatized and it could be mainstreamed and everybody with, with choice would want to be there just as people who didn't have choice would think it was a great place and so on. And we came up with all these things and, and we responded. And we actually won. And we didn't know what the hell we were doing, but for the next two years, we crafted something that became the national model for how you transform underserved communities. And we woke up the next day and we were national experts. So the first time anywhere in the country that you could transform a public housing site and have a community where public housing households could live with other affordable and market rate and so on, which was not legally or regulatorily possible prior to Centennial. So we gave birth to the model, the holistic community revitalization model, and we lucked into that. And so the phone rang all the time. We said a lot of no's. No, we are not interested or not ready because there were really only two or three of us or four. Uh, but over time, we grew. And so we came to existence really on the community development end of the spectrum. That's what community development is. We're not affordable housing developers, or we, we do develop housing that has affordability in it. And those were the early days. But I want you to think of the spectrum from community development, and I'll use the left for that because it is kind of left-leaning, to commercial real estate, okay? And so these people, they're in transformations. It's about community. The adjective community is important. So it's community development, and this is commercial real estate. This is transformations. This is transactions. This is about people. This is about the deal. This is Main Street. This is Wall Street. Two ends of the spectrum. Different cultures. The people don't usually communicate with each other. They speak different languages. They come from a different place because these people are sort of warm and fuzzy and it's all about, oh, I love people and I'm these people just want to, I want to make as much money as possible. The investors want their return, and it's all about the deal. So Integral is kind of a polka dot unicorn. <clears throat> You've never seen a unicorn. You certainly haven't seen a polka dot one because we actually have both this and this in the same organization. And so you may see us doing a development that has some of that funny sociology and so on associated with it, and then you may see us doing a deal that really is transformational in a different way, that is, um, as in assembly, the old GM plant that we acquired, and we're doing something, and that's transformation in a different way. It's regional trans transformation. It will probably have more economic development impact than anything we've ever done. Centennial will have or has had more impact on a human scale than anything we've ever done. And because it was copied many times here in Atlanta, 
copied across the country. The one thing we're clear about is that there are people running around now, little kids, that are experiencing a different life that would never have had that opportunity had we not created that model. And we don't need to be reminding them every day, oh, we did this or we did that. It is about creating something that removes the barriers for people who, to give them a chance to be able to be successful and be all the things that fits inside their God-given human potential. So that's who Integral is. And I'll do two quick, I, I can never follow a script, okay? So I don't even know what I wrote down here. I know I have a few slides up there, so I may need to use some of them. Um, so let me just do probably one on Centennial and then a few on Assembly. And the thing I want you to keep in mind is one of the things that was special about the model that caused it to be embraced is it is a mixed income model. As a company, we do not fundamentally believe in concentrating poor people. And, and I go back to our psychology and philosophy in this country is you put poor people in a place and you contain them and you make sure they can't get out and mess up. You create heaven and hell and you hope that he hell never contaminates heaven, but that doesn't work. If they're too far apart, it's a matter of time before hell contaminates heaven. So the fundamental philosophy about how we do our housing developments where we're trying to transform underserved communities is to create environments that are sustainable. There's not that wide gap and you do mix of incomes. So the idea is that an individual can see right in front, but if you, every time you look out, those people all the way over there have everything and you have nothing, eventually you have a bad dynamic at work. And so we believe in a mix of incomes that creates sustainability. And so that mixed income model at the core of our housing component of the holistic um, transformation is what was unique about the, the project. Um, this is just who we are today. So we are headquartered here in Atlanta, but we have offices in San Francisco, LA, Denver, and Dallas. Um, we're about 300 people in the organization, and um, we're private, we're for-profit, we're urban, we're mission-driven, we're real estate development and investment. And all of those are important to help to define who we are. We are vertically integrated, so we develop, we build, we own, we manage. Oh, thank you for sharing. Um, and because we do work in the urban center, it's almost impossible to do any major project in an urban center without being in a public-private partnership. Even if you don't have it formally executed as a public-private partnership, you are in a public-private partnership because issues around zone and uh, environmental challenges, neighborhood issues, et cetera, et cetera, puts you in the bullseye of this public policy urban development space. And so we say that is one of the things that is in fact our strength because we were urban before it was popular and stylish to be urban. Um, and so today everybody's in the urban development business because the world is getting more urbanized. So that's who we are today. And this is, I'll go past that. All of these are foundational to the model that we built to create Centennial. So the whole idea was all of the components that I identified as being elements of what you need to have a healthy and sustainable community were put together somehow on that 60 acres or connected to other places, uh, uh, to other providers so that we'd have the complexity addressed in the way in which we put the model together. And so you've seen it. All right, so imagine um, a friend asked me to take a look at the site up at um, Doraville years ago. And I said, man, we don't go that far out to the city. I need a passport for that. <laughs> um, and anyway, I did eventually. And the thing that was clear is 
it was the hole in the donut. It was an opportunity to transform in a different way um, with a more regional focus. But everybody knew that it was a mini city that GM had out there and 3.6 million square feet, 90 acres on the roof on a 165 acre site. And so Sembler had gone in, Hines had gone in, Seven Oaks had gone in, New Broad Street had gone in, and here comes group number five. Um, and this was, we acquired it in 2014. So if you visualize a process that started three and a half years before that, we were still in the middle of not too pleasant times. So we didn't really know how we would do it, but we thought the site was attractive. And what I would say to you is, in reflection, we, all the time that we were complaining about how difficult it was to work with GM, they were taking so long, and you give them a draft of the contract, and it took two months before they even commented, and then they had a whole bunch of comments, on and on and on, 16 months to negotiate the contract, 17 months of due diligence. What we didn't know is, that was divine intervention. You know, the Lord looks out for children and fools, and we were too old to be called children. So he was letting the clock run so the economy could be recovering. So by the time we acquired it, we weren't that far away from when things had come back. Had we been successful and gotten exactly what we want, we would have, been, we would have had the site almost three years earlier in a very different time. So that's how you know when you're blessed or getting grace. So that's what we did. And GM had a big number for the, pro for the property, and so we closed. We had the gun, the proverbial gun to the head. And one of the things we did in our strategy was we tried to figure out how we could get to a point where we could get the basis down quickly. So we negotiated or pre-negotiated an out parcel sale for about 20 acres. But we spent a lot of time valuing the salvage. So I would ask you, the GM plan, 3.6 million square feet, what does anyone in here think the salvage value of that, of the, all that stuff to be demolished was? Anybody, just pick a number. 10 million, 50 million, okay, so some good and, okay, two data points. Very good. It is actually, put it this way, the demolition cost about $12 million, and the demolition contractor gave us $14 million at the closing table. So that's, if you add those two and you're at $26 million and they weren't doing it to break even, so you'd have to assume that the number was somewhere north of $30, some $30 million. So let's say mid-30s, I don't know what the number was, but that's what it was worth. So we spent our time doing that valuation ahead of time so that we could show up to the closing table and take the basis down almost immediately and then again uh, when we did the out parcel sale. So you close with the gun to your head, you do this with one transaction, the salvage, you do this with the uh, sale of the out parcel, and so the gun isn't quite in the holster yet, but. It, the idea was to develop a strategy where you'd have patience so you wouldn't just grab the first deal that came to the table because the interest clock is eating you alive. So that's what we did, and so we're in a great position, and the site is, in every respect, probably the best economic development site in the entire state. Two entrances on and off the interstate at Peachtree Industrial and Buford Highway, two transit stations, one directly at the site at Doraville, and a half mile down the, uh, beyond the other end of the site is the Shambly Station. Peachtree DeKalb Airport is 2.5 miles from the site, so if you have a C-suite, um, you land at your, in your private jet, you're in the office in five minutes. We are to the north, we have all the bedroom communities. To the south, four miles is Buckhead, and, and on and on. The goal lines, if you got on the last stop on the transit station at Doraville and never got off heading south, you end up at the airport. 
uh, everything that we were looking at when we evaluate in the site in terms of its attractiveness, um, those were the things we saw and those were the things we were trying to capitalize on. And we spent a lot of time fighting over a strategy to fund the infrastructure because the school system in, Doraville, in um, DeKalb County decided that um, the school system shouldn't support infrastructure investment in projects because somehow the private development community should fund s sewers and roads and so on and so forth. So the public infrastructure funding was a little bit of a challenge, but we started early enough that on the overall schedule it ended up being about a two-month delay. But we had to play that out for a pretty long time, and so we created a structure that was also pretty innovative. They say um, invention, was it the Success is the, say it again? Success is the mother of invention. Uh, necessity is the mother of invention. I was going to say, you don't even know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> okay, so, so now everything is positioned and we, we landed a major corporate user and we have a million plus square feet on the development out there and you all have heard the big A word, Amazon. We're one of 10,000 people looking to chase Amazon. It's a long shot at best, but um, we like what we have independent of Amazon's presence. And so more to come on that. The idea there is I have been blessed to live a pretty um, fulfilling and broad lifespan and really a lot of my heart is doing things internationally. So we're working in the Caribbean and we're over on the African continent trying to incubate some things. So who knows what the next five years, ten years, however long the Lord lets me live, will be like. So that's all I have to say. And I hope that there are some questions somewhere in here because I just went all over the waterfront and hopefully somebody can frame a set of questions that seem to be somehow relevant to something I said. I knew Jim was going to cause trouble. Yeah, Jim, how you doing, man? <laughs> Egbert, you spoke just briefly about Amazon, but what is your understanding about what they are looking for and what do you have that might match up well with uh, qualifications? So we, we tell the state we will not um, say much about their process other than just at a superficial level, but you know they ask for people who think they have sites sometimes to mayors, sometimes to private firms uh, to, submit it, to submit their sites, and they got 67 um, submissions. I think they're going to turn in about anywhere from five to ten sites for the state. So if you multiply that by all the other states that are doing the same thing, uh, Amazon is having a field day. By the process they use, you can safely assume that they made three or four hundred million dollars for themselves because everybody's in a race to the bottom. Who can give us the most money? Who can give Amazon the most money um, to attract them? So they're probably getting a good deal. Um, but they had criteria, eight criteria uh, in, their, in their RFP for what they were looking for. Logistics, access to transit, immediate access to the interstate, and a bunch of things. And we checked every one of those but we had a few others that they didn't ask for that we know are enhancers. So PDK, you know, they want to be within 45 minutes of an international airport. Well, we have that, but we're also two and a half miles from the not international airport, but the ones that the C-suite users, uh, the C-suite is interested in. So that wasn't on the list, but that's something we add. Um, in terms of transformation, they say they'd like to be transformational. Well, 1.5 million people are half a mile. The, s the county line is a half a mile from the site. That's Gwinnett County. If they connect on transit, they should be connecting at Doraville. And you can imagine that opening up that corridor to be able to connect to transit. The state has done a, made a number of improvements with their managed lanes, which is almost like a uh, bus loop, if you will, uh, a BRT, connecting 400 and 
85 and you have a link it actually connects over to Cobb County so you're able to connect on the northern arc by in a way that really gets you accessibility to transit that doesn't exist until the actual transit is there but this bridges that and so there are a number of things about the site Jim that is that if you're Amazon sitting there and you look at their criteria you can do a check 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 as I'm sure a lot of other sites can but then we have these other things that are important, may be important to them, certainly are important to us as a region. Okay. Hey, pa I knew, Parker, you couldn't have used this. Okay. <laughs> don't go, don't do anything crazy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, going back to where I know your heart is, the first part of your talk, uh -huh. um, the, word, the words affordable housing uh -huh. is an easy easy term to roll off the tongue, mm -hmm. but I think not such an easy thing to accomplish. And mm -hmm. so I know you don't specialize in affordable housing, you specialize in mixed income developments, but in the real world of Atlanta or some other city, how do you actually create, what is the math, what, what do you do to create the affordable housing piece of any of your mixed income developments? Uh, that, that's, that's actually a very, very, very good question because everybody uses the, now everybody's conscious of we need affordable housing. Of course, they don't know what they mean by that. <laughs> and usually if they knew, if they think about what they're saying when they say that, some of them have competing views because they really don't want some of the people that would be in affordable housing living near them. They haven't reconciled that gap. So I want to change the conversation to the problem we have is not a need for affordable housing. We need to address housing affordability, which is a different thing. You need to address housing affordability for people from the low economic end of the spectrum all the way up to and including, but before you reach into the market, so the high-end market. They'll take care of themselves. They have the resources, whatever the market will bear, et cetera, et cetera. That's all covered but 80% of the country's population and workforce live in a middle, and they call it workforce housing. I kind of hate the term because it suggests that only those people work. <laughs> and the people on the lower end oftentimes work two and three jobs, and the people up here I think are also working, notwithstanding that they're paying top dollar. So think about affordable housing this way when you hear it to be able to distinguish what you should, what conversation you really are in. If you are between zero and 60% of the area median income, there are resources available to help buy down or bring down the cost of rent. It's low income housing tax credits, okay? So it forces a, you get a tax credit treatment if you invest in that housing that serves that population, and in exchange, you have to keep your rents down. So the federal government, through a tax program, is enabling investment for that segment. Now, it's never enough dollars, but it's dollars nonetheless. So that exists, and so you oftentimes hear people talk about affordable housing as zero to 60% of area median. That's because of that magic program. And it's the best federal program ever created, I think. So what happens if you're over 60, but you're not all the way to market, which is where 80% of the population is? There are no programs for that. So the most acute problem, problem that exists without resources to respond to it naturally, um, is that segment. And that's where, that's what you could call workforce housing. So it's six, over 60% of area median up to about 140%. If arbitrarily 140% is what you define as where the market starts to function purely off of a here's a product and this 10% slice over here can buy that product, that's over here. Call it luxury if you want. But that middle is the challenge. So really what you need is housing affordability from zero all the way up to 140% of area median. So I chaired a task force for Mayor Franklin uh, back in the day 
where she asked me to come up with some housing policy. And the thing I learned very quickly is, and we were copying things from some other cities, when you say affordable housing, people automatically think poor black and brown people. Oh, I don't want affordable housing in my neighborhood. If you want to change the conversation, you then have to create different images. So you take pictures of a nurse and a police and a firefighter and a young college student and so on and so forth, and you say, yeah, we need affordable housing, and you show those images, and then well, everybody is about, everybody cares for and supports affordable housing. So a lot of it is up here. And to get away from people's biases or how they're wired or some of the things that are ingrained in the society we live in, you have to have the conversation be broad enough to get everybody to care about the issue, and then you can do your slicing and dicing inside of that. So you can mix, you can do mixed income that mixes some lower end, or what in this three segment affordable workforce luxury, includes some affordable and some workforce. And we do a lot of those. We've probably produced 10,000 units of housing like that across the country, maybe 3,500 3, to 4,000 units here. You also can do luxury and workforce. And you hear that oftentimes described as the 80-20 or the 85-15, where you're building something in Buckhead. If you're building something in Buckhead, but you have to now introduce 20% affordability, and the affordability you're talking about is down on this end, that gap between what the rents are that you get on this unit up here that you're building in Buckhead, and you're jumping all the way past this middle to try and bring some of that affordability or units that are going to be affordable to somebody making less than 60% of area median, that's a whole lot of money taken out of your pro forma, a lot of, a lot of revenues. And you can't force that. It's, it would be like a taken. So you're going to have to have an incentive and a deep subsidy to do that. But if your 80-20 or 85-15, whatever your mix is, is actually speaking to something more like 100 or 120 percent of area median, which is still in the workforce category, then that delta is not so big and you can kind of navigate that. So you have to be clear when you look at the pro forma what it is you're overlaying because housing affordability is the broad term. Affordable housing, you have to then ask the next question, are you talking about this or are you talking about affordable housing being really workforce housing? Okay? And it's a math game. Yeah, John? Egbert, can you share a little bit of your experience chairing the board of Fannie Mae and maybe a highlight or two? Um, yeah. So. That, that really has been uh, an education. I've, I've been on the board of Fannie Mae. I was one of the 10 directors recruited right after the government put Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac into receivership. And uh, the idea was to help reform Fannie and Freddie and the housing finance system. The housing finance system is about an $11 trillion system. Fannie Mae is a $3.2 trillion organization. It's the largest financial institution in the United States. And it is a, it really was an education. I can't believe they were paying us. Um, because truth be told, one out of three dollars in the U.S. economy is related to housing. 33 percent, it's really 35 percent of the U.S. economy is housing related. And it's not something you naturally think of. So we hold about 18 million mortgages, one in three mortgages in this country. And John, I would say we went through free fall for a few years. Then it sort of, we slowed it down while we're sort of re retooling the organization. And the organization has really been fixed now for a number of years, but it's sort of a political football. So we got, we signed an SPSPA, Senior Preferred Stock Purchase Agreement, with 
treasury for a $200 billion line. And that's what we would use as we are going through the reform of the company. And we drew $116.1 billion against that line. And we were paying a 10% dividend to the government, to Treasury, for using that line. In 2012, to everybody's shock, we were going to be able to start operating in the black. Because people thought, this is done. And uh, that year, we gave back to, we gave to Treasury, I can't say back, and I'll explain that in a second. We gave Treasury a check for $85.8 .8 billion. Now, if you recall the debt ceiling crisis uh, and the debate that was going to be the Waterloo for President Obama when he, it was coming up and the Republicans were saying we're not going to raise the debt ceiling and so on and so forth, and then it was, oh, well, you know what? We can push the problem off till the end of the next qu first quarter next year. That was because they got Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's check. So we no longer had a debt ceiling crisis. And that was the biggest problem we faced. Because once that happened, the government was stuck on getting this off the books money. And so we're in conservatorship still, even though our hands are tied. And I will say this. So John, we've, we've now given to Treasury a hundred and sixty three billion, I think, against the one sixteen borrowed, but we still owe the principal of one hundred and sixteen point one billion. Because all of what they got has been classified as dividends. So it's a it's it's really a, a I forgot we're being taped. So <laughs> um it's a very difficult I'm 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 do I'm done, I'm really ready to be off the board. The system is working, but it's now dysfunctional because it's largely um, political. There are 8 million foreclosures, and we had about 2 million of them. The largest wealth transfer in the history of this country happened during the Great Recession. It took the middle class, it transferred middle class wealth to an investor class in one fell swoop. And nobody batted an eye. And for me, I think about it, you couldn't get access to mortgages if you were minorities, especially if you look like us, until just a generation ago. So the, most, the newest entrance to the 75 to 80 percent of all wealth that's transferred in this country is home equity. And you couldn't build wealth in the black community legally because you wouldn't get access to mortgages until just a generation ago. So the newest entrance to the rung of wealth building in this country, when the crash happened, they were the first to be wiped out. So it wiped out black wealth accumulation overnight. And because you're new to the ranks, you don't have some reserves to tap into. So it impoverished a whole segment of the population. And that is, for me, the biggest challenge we're dealing with. So one of the things I did, as soon, I took over as board chair al uh, almost four years ago. And I created something called Access to Credit and Affordable Housing Working Group. And it's all about expanding the coverage in the credit box. So we are in a certain range of, um, let's say, 680, we actually push above that, but let's say 680 as the low end of the, the um, FICO scores. And we go up to now 97% of LTV, 97% loan to value. But if you look at what we've been doing over this time, we really are only serving a small part of the box. And the question is, how do we serve the entire box, because the portion of the box that was not served are those very people I was describing, that are high LTVs and uh, low FICOs 
all still within our control box. So that's one of the things I'm working on aggressively. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. You and then you. I'll get you. Thank you. I think I have this turned on. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'm grateful I'm here today. You're a very inspiring leader. That being said, uh, you seem like the most qualified person to run for mayor of Atlanta. This is an upcoming election, so. <laughs> okay, let me just change it. How about <laughs> two questions? What advice would you give to the next mayor, especially as it relates to transportation or lack thereof? Uh, and then I work with Madison. She's a next generation leader. What, uh, what advice would you give to the next generation of leaders here in Atlanta? I can tell you a problem in class in, as a kid, right? Um, he's still a problem? Okay, I believe that, as evident by the question. Um, uh, this is a complicated region. Even any one jurisdiction is complicated because it's all about collaboration. And you can be all you would like to make people think you are, but in the final analysis, if you haven't learned how to work with other people that have different views and create, have an ability to create a big enough tent that all of those people can see themselves fitting under, there's no way you can truly be successful, especially when history looks back at your tenure. So you have to come in with a view that every one of these counties and all of these cities evolved in their own way, but in the final analysis, you better recognize that you need to partner with them. It's not a them, us, or we're gonna beat you, we're gonna do this. And you can't be, um, you can't be too, <laughs> I'm trying to be very delicate here, and it's, it's very difficult for me because I usually just say what I think, so I won't do that today. Um, but suffice it to say, we have a very divided region, and we need the next leader in the city and, and all the leaders in the major segments of the region need to be selected not just because of their political whatever, but because they understand that the next generation of growth in this city and in the metro region will be the result of putting people in place, people with a view that is more strategic than narrow. And we haven't done a good job of that. And if you look at it on a national level, that's the problem we have. People know that they'll get elected even though they are self-centered, narrow focus, whatever, whatever, they'll win their votes to put them right back in, but our problems as a nation are like this, and you're putting people in that have a view like this. Well, we're doing the same thing here. We're also, as a city, reaching a point where we're going to have to pick ma the next mayor in Atlanta. We're gonna have to pick the next mayor um, in a very difficult time because you're now at that break point between white and black, wh who controls the most votes. And the last 40 years, it was decidedly black. There are some people who think that the color should decide who they vote for. Um, I think we're finally maturing to a point where we're saying, no, we just need a great leader. But that great leader needs to understand that they have to be concerned about both communities. And I'm not sure where we are right now with that. And I think the runoff will be where a lot of that plays out. Because we haven't been racial yet, but we're just starting and we'll get more racial. And it's a legitimate thing because if you're west or south of the city, nothing has happened in your community. Your communities are on a down debt spiral. And we need leadership that's gonna say, okay, so we can't have all of that right off that whole segment of the city. We need to have a strategy to help all of the parts of the city grow and thrive. And so, so depending on who gets in, people have different views about whether they'll even care about that side of the city or not. Okay. 
Egbert, maybe as a follow-up question to what you just touched on, but um, as you look around Atlanta, even Athens, or a lot of major cities through the country, mm -hmm. you know, the poverty that existed 20, 30, 40 years ago still is there. Mm -hmm. It's probably just been displaced or dispersed. Um, you know, we, we all see it as we drive around the city. There's, mm -hmm. you know, there's still, again, there's poverty, let's say, that used to exist down mm -hmm. uh, where Centennial Place is, and it's just other places now. I mean, can you talk about kind of the challenges of sure. how you, how does how kind of the system or communities work through that because you know i think of like clayton county for example mm -hmm. i mean they got some challenges because there's just a lot of different you know dynamics going on there yeah uh, it's it's really at the heart that question is at the heart of the issue the question is if you fix here but you haven't fixed here and you haven't fixed here and you haven't fixed here then what you're doing is causing people to vote with their feet to the next place where they can find a, an environment that is a healthy environment. You can't fix it piece by piece. So right now, let's go micro for a second. If you're in the city and take a $1 of tax revenues, 52 cents goes to the school system, 20 something cents goes to the county, and the remainder goes to the city. You're the city, you have your priorities and you're working in neighborhood X. The school system has its priorities and it's working in neighborhood Y. And the county has its priorities and work, it's working in neighborhood Z, neighborhood Z. Okay, what happens if there was a strategic plan of priorities that were developed by the city, the county, and the school system to leverage their dollars to work in the same neighborhoods? So that when, this, when the school system is targeting a particular neighborhood for building a strong school, and it happens to be the same place that the city is trying to build or support the building of a healthy housing and transportation investment, and the county is providing its services pursuant to those priorities, all of a sudden, your ability to have significant effect quickly is enhanced. Right now, that's not the model we have. We're doing all of this scattered shock. Well, in a regional context, it's the same problem. If hell is Clayton County and other places are closer to heaven, you're gonna have a whole lot of bad stuff having, happening there while it's better in other places. So you're gonna be having exodus out of Clayton County and the only people left there will be the people who have no choice and no mobility. Now, I'm not saying, I'm using Clayton because you said that. Quite frankly, we have hell in all of our um, area, all of our cities. But it is the absence of a coordinated and collaborative leadership style, regionally and locally, that is the basis for or the reason for the perpetuation of the disparate problems that we have when it comes to poverty and our inability to tackle them. You know, in that centennial, and that's really micro, 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 okay? Um, you have, we still have challenges because you're managing a sociology. I mean, if you've been poor for a generation or two, you've been institutionalized. And you have to create environments where you're removing that institutionalization. If you went to a mental institution and you were getting treatment or you were locked up in a mental institution, chances are when you come out into the real world, you're not really ready and prepared unless you were being prepared when you were inside, and that's usually not the case. Well, we have communities that have been institutionalized for two generations. And it, to, un to unlock the potential of the people in those communities in a way that allows them to navigate the mainstream successfully requires affirmative action. I don't want to conjure up the image that goes through man when you hear affirmative action, meaning we need to take affirmative steps recognizing that that's the challenge or problem we're trying to solve, and we need to devise a way of functioning that is addressing that challenge. And that's what we don't do well. It's hard to do that because we've created these artificial boundaries called 
city jurisdictions and county jurisdictions, but you jump from one side to the other, guess what? But for the fact that somebody drew a line, that line is really irrelevant. And so it suggests that we have to have leadership that understands that these artificial boundaries are just that, artificial, but we need problem, we need solutions that solve problems across those lines and are agnostic to those lines. And you very seldom find politicians that make transformational decisions that may come to life in somebody else's administration because they're thinking about the next election. It's hard to find leaders who say, I'm going to do the right thing, and it may be that two mayors from now will get credit for it or it will be happening on their watch, but I'm doing the right thing because I'm serving people. We're long, we're far away from that. Most people are so self-centered, so driven to their own legacy that very few strategic decisions I can think of get conceived and implemented in a mayoral administration or presidential administration. It usually takes a longer horizon, and that, I think, is one of the biggest problems we have. We have a short-sighted view on things that require long-term solutions. Yes? understand we have time for one last question. I okay. guess I got lucky. Okay. Um, I've heard a number of theories as to what caused the Great Recession. Mm -hmm. um, my personal belief is, like any accident, there's multiple causes. But in your position uh, or in your experience on the, the Fannie Mae board, mm -hmm. what do you say to the folks that theorize that uh, a relaxation of uh, mortgage lending standards was a, a primary driver of the uh, economic downturn? Um, they're wrong. The, it's not the relaxation. So, you know, I, I went into my uh, assignment with very naive view of what the real issue was. And the fact is, so let's take Fanny for a moment. If this is a football game, and, oh, Georgia is doing well this year too. <laughs> if this is a football game, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac entered the football game in the second half of the fourth quarter. Okay? The game, is, the game was mortgage lending, mortgage securitization, um, making money. And the truth is what happened, the sub, subprime market, Fannie and Freddie control about 52% of the mortgage market, two of them together. Fannie's about 60% um, of that, Freddie's about 40. And that market had gotten so large that on new originations, Fannie and Freddie had dropped from 52% to 25%. So all of that subprime stuff was happening without Fannie and Freddie's involvement. It, they couldn't be involved because those mortgages wouldn't fit the criteria. So what happened is <coughs> Fannie and Freddie would go to the Hill and the politicians would say, you're only 25% of the mortgage market. Why should I be listening to you about policy? I might as well go talk to the big banks. And the shareholders were saying, you know, I see all these bank, commercial banks and investment banks making all this money, and you guys are not looking out for shareholders' interests because y'all are on the sidelines. So in the second half of the fourth quarter, Fannie and Freddie went to Wall Street and bought $700 billion worth of the junk that couldn't go through their screen. <coughs> Excuse me. And 90% of the losses that Fannie and Freddie experienced came out of that portfolio that they bought. Now, what was that portfolio? It was subprime that was on the private label PLS, private label securities. Alte, um, the, you hear about the no dark loans and so on. To me, this is personal view, I'm not expressing the view of Fannie Mae or the government, um, the biggest culprit in this process was the fact that rating agencies were rating securities that were on the pinned by mortgages that had no strength at all. They were not backed by documents. 
no, not income verifications, et cetera, et cetera, and saying these are A-rated securities. And the investment bankers were making a pile of money. The rating agencies were making a pile of money. And if you tell anybody, especially somebody who aspires to own their own home, which most people do, and some didn't think it was possible, and you show up on their doorstep and say, I can help you become a homeowner, guess what? Their game. And so the system raped and pillaged. And everybody was making a bunch of money. And it just kept going on and on and on. And the more the likelihood of losing that gravy train came, the more people were willing to lower standards. So that's when you get to a point where you just call up on the phone and say, I want a mortgage. I'm alive. You can tell I'm alive. I'm breathing. <laughs> uh, and they say, OK, look on the email. Oh, you don't have email. We'll run somebody by with some documents for you to sign. And boom. And that ends up in a package and is sold. And the problem is the contagion was the challenge. Because one of the reasons why housing is a third of the US economy, because Fannie and Freddie are not federal government, but they were viewed as having this implicit government guarantee, their securities were almost like treasury. And when the private label security market said, we have something that's just as good as Fannie and Freddie, and here it is, and it's now this size, and Fannie and Freddie are this size, and people are buying this. The people buying this are governments from across the world. So foreign direct investment flowing into this country and into this economy through the purchase of these securities meant that we had con created contagion that we could destroy the reserves of nations because of the size of this. So something had to be done, and you couldn't just say, let's crash Fannie and Freddie. So the problem we have was greed. And, and the minute you put that into the equation and have huge lobbying efforts to Congress, the relaxation started. And it just went on and on and on. And if you look at the curve now, we have something we call an ACI, which is an acquisition composite index for all the stuff that we acquire. And we got in an, on the board, and about a year into it, we said, well, what fool couldn't tell that we're heading for a crisis? Because it's really obvious. But nobody was measuring it. Nobody was monitoring it. It's like the, the, the snake swallowing the pig. And you know, it's just going through the system. And you can see where it is. It's a bubble, and it's coming. It's just a matter of time before it's here. But nobody was looking, because everybody was making too much money. That's the crisis. And when it hit, you had, and, and the biggest beneficiaries, are there bankers in here? Who's a banker in here? <laughs> Nobody wants to raise their hand because they don't know what I'm getting ready to say. Listen, I'm a developer. We're now down on the bottom of the totem pole. We're even lower than bankers now. Um, but the bankers have been the greatest beneficiaries. If you think about it, in years past, until this last crisis, when the economy, when you had a recession, the bankers had to call you in and say, listen, Egbert, I um, need to look at this loan. I need to help you restructure it. Why? Because they can't afford to reserve for these really bad loans, these w way defaulted loans. So they were motivated to help you work out the problem. When the federal government said, OK, we're going to let banks have a cost of capital of 0.2, 20 basis points. That means the banks could sit back there. Hell, any fool can make a spread on 0.2%. So they didn't, without addressing the core problems. So the banks didn't have to work with homeowners and all the borrowers to help structure and refix, uh, uh, rework their loans. They could sit back, let you die on the vine, they were being subsidized by the government by this low interest rate. And the end result is people's problems weren't being fixed. So that's why foreclosures went as high as they were, did. Banks went in, I mean, um, borrowers had the challenges they had because the banks were being bailed out without any motivation, or it took all the motivation out to say, I need to work with you to restructure your loan. And that subsidy 
exists today as well. It's been going on now for all these years. So the banks have rebuilt their balance sheet without being a part of the solution to the average homeowner or the average borrower. And that's why we've had the slow drip, 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 because what typically happens is the crisis happens, the banks and everybody are working everything out, you have a crash for a while, and then boom, it starts to pick back up. We didn't have that. We get, did this restructure in a different way, and it meant that the pace of recovery was so slow that we've been living with that all this time. Okay? Thank you very much, guys. We are grateful to have such an inspiring leader among us this morning who has really transformed communities, not just in our own city, but across the country and international. Thank you, Egbert. We truly need more polka-dotted unicorns like you. It is our tradition at Terry Third Thursday to thank our speakers with this lovely glass sculpture that was designed by Loretta Eby. And Egbert, I'd love for you to come forward so we could present this to you as a very small token of our appreciation for being with us this morning. And one last logistical note, please get your parking validated at the desk if you haven't already before you leave this morning. Thank you for coming, and we hope to see you in November.